Hi, I'm Rob. And I'm Angie. And, and together, together we, we are, are Twinfinity. Twin we are Twin Flames doing a different kind of a video for us. This is actually by your guys' request. When we did our live Q&A, I think it was last month or maybe a month and a half ago now, you guys were asking about Twin Flame signs and had requested that we do a video on it. So here we are. It's taken us a while to do this because it took us a while to put it all together. <laughs> yeah, and, and it all started out as, yeah, you know, maybe we should do this. So we got chatting about it just as we were starting a drive towards the mountains. Our favorite place. Yeah, and, and so we had to dig out a scrap of paper and there was a pen somewhere in our vehicle. And it turned into a big long discussion this is our scrap of paper. That's our scrap that's, of paper. That's how this started. Both sides. <laughs> uh, and, and it just didn't end up being signs. It seemed to have phases or stages to it. Yeah. Actually, Rob was the one that started kind of as we would write stuff. He would go. And what we did is we basically retraced our steps in our own journey and that's how we came up with the signs from not only our own experiences, but everything that we've communicated with you guys over the years, just being on the Twin Flame journey for as long as we have since 2012. So uh, just communicating with other twins and our own journey, we've just noticed a lot of common signs for Twin Flames in general. And as we were noticing them, Rob started going, hey, this, this one should go here and that's kind of a stage and that's kind of a stage. So we've not only built signs, but we've built stages. So this video is 50 twin flame signs within seven stages. Whew, yeah. it's been quite the project. That's a lot. Starting out with a conversation and uh, Angie's poured a ton of work into putting this onto our pieces of paper. Uh, I had to catch up with some of it because of course <laughs> she gets typing away and throws in an expansion <laughs> on an idea. And I had no idea of it, about that because this was done outside of driving to the mountains. Yes. So we wanted to just preface a couple things. Just to clarify, of course, you do not have to have every single one of these no. signs to be a twin flame. These are just general common signs within the journey. And also, your signs might not fit within the stages that we've experienced them in. They might fit in other stages. Or they might fit in more than one stages, which has been common for our journey, too, and yeah. a lot of people's. So just bear that in mind, that it doesn't mean, oh my God, if I'm not experiencing this in this stage, I'm not a twin flame. Not at all. And you know your journey best. So this is just a guide, and this is just because you guys have requested it that we're doing this. This isn't to say um, you are or you are not a twin flame just because of our list. You know, our, and our list got quite large, like 50 points to, to ponder became big. And yes. we thought of maybe condensing it down to a top 20 or a top 15. It didn't really work that no. way. They, they're all valid points in their own way, especially when we've looked at the journeys that uh, have been described to us by, by others. And they all, they all matter. Yeah. So it's a big list. Yes. So on that note, we're going to get started because we have 50 things to talk about. And not only are we going to talk about each sign, we're going to give you examples from our own life so that you can then understand it. But it's not one that you resonate with or not one you've experienced. You can go, oh, at least I see what they mean because of our own examples. So we've decided I'm the odd one. I'm going to share all the odd ones. And Rob gets to be the... I, I'm, I'm the even one. In other words, she goes one, three, five, six. I go two, four, six. <laughs> That's right. We both decided we were a little bit odd on this, but I'd have to, someone would have to carry the even side, so I guess that was me. <laughs> you can be less odd than me. Okay. So first stage is before even meeting. And yes, I know this might seem weird to people, but there are things that happen on this journey before you even meet each other. Things that set you up for this journey or, or that set up uh, either events or tendencies that become part of the journey. Yeah. So we have, in this stage, four signs. First one is that you experience a traumatic childhood, usually abuse, abandonment, um, addictions, bullying. Yeah. Again, not everybody's going to have this, but this is a common trait within the Twin Flame connection. Yeah, and usually these, <clears throat> these problems from childhood end up being triggers that your Twin Flame step right on, major, major triggers that... Exactly. that usually 
come right before the separation stage. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And why do we have this as a common sign is because most of us as twin flames, if not all of us, are very advanced souls and we have come here to clear a lot of that old um, gunk, garbage, Some would traumas. call it karma. Yes, that too. So we've taken on really heavy lives in this life to clear it and clear it for good, not only for us, but the collective. So for me, I grew up with a lot of trauma. I had an abusive childhood growing up in my family. I had a father who was very angry, physically abusive, emotionally abusive, mentally abusive, you name it. He had it, except for the sexual. But I got that elsewhere. I also was sexually abused by two of my uncles. And I, I can say that with a smile because I know I chose it. I'm not a victim to it, just like none of us are, right? We've chosen these things for a reason. And you also had trauma in your own way. Yeah, I had uh, a huge amount of bullying when, when I was a kid. I didn't really fit in. Of course, back when, when I was a kid, I didn't really realize what I, why I didn't fit in. Uh, there was a lot of problems there, and it really made me very cautious as to who I chose as my friends mm -hmm. because I had some friends that all of a sudden became non-friends. It was really quite a, a lonely time in my childhood. I learned to get by on my own, which when it came to a spiritual journey, sometimes you are on your own. So I, I learned it the hard way as a kid. <laughs> Sign number two is... A feeling or a deep knowing of a unique connection or special love. Yes. I had always thought that, you know, love is great. Uh, yes, I experienced love as a very young adult or even in late teens. But it, it wasn't just a longing for a deeper connection. It was a knowing that, that there was a, a connection out there I could... I could feel it. I had way more love in me than I'd ever been taught by any relationships. Mm -hmm. So I had that that gnawing and knowledge that that there would be somebody else out there yeah. that also had that same feeling that came innately in them, not that they were learning through others. Yeah. And for me, it actually wasn't that. Um, because I had so much trauma from men in my life, I actually never planned to have a relationship, to date, to marry, any of that. But I'd always had this weird connection with twins. I loved twins. I um, just had a fascination with them. I had always thought that I would have twin girls. I, I had always planned to either adopt or use a sperm bank because I was not going to get married when I was a young girl. But even from the age of 12, 12 on, I had always planned to have twin girls, and I even had their names. Nancy and Nicole is who they were going to be. So even though I didn't have this feeling or this knowing of a big love or a special love, I had this something unique about twin flame or twins in general. So that was a neat, fun, yeah. neat one for me. Number three is spiritual guidance that leads you to each other. So this one's kind of a neat example for me. If you know or have watched our uh, journey to union, you might remember this as part of our story. I was just graduating from nursing school in a city not where Rob and I currently live, but about three hours away. And I just felt this strong call that I had to move to another city. I was such a homebody that it wasn't even a common thing for me to even think of moving, but yet I did. And everything guided me right down to the apartment I ended up living in, which you'll see shortly in our journey made a lot of sense. And for me, I, I had this very strong drawing to Calgary myself too. It's, I, I, as soon as I discovered the mountains, I wanted to be closer to the mountains. And when I lived in Edmonton, I had a chance to live 17 stories up in an apartment <laughs> tower facing west, which was just wonderful. Enjoyed that. Well, loved watching the thunderstorms come in. So a career opportunity just opened up right in front of me to move down to Calgary and grab. And I already had an idea where I wanted to live. And it led me right to the building and the direction and the side and everything that Angie would eventually move to 
three years later. Yes. And just a quick story. When I moved to Calgary and I was looking for a place, I was I didn't know Calgary at all. I was just guided to go downtown. Again, didn't even know why, just followed it. I didn't believe in guidance or understood guidance at that point. But I remember putting my hand on a door handle of an apartment building and I heard in my head, no, not this one. Again, I didn't know anything about guidance, angels, spirit guides, none of that. But I was very strongly guided to the apartment building that we ended up both living in. Number four, yearning for the one. <laughs> yeah. Angie had a much better grip on this one than I did. She uh she wrote a list of 40 qualities that she wanted in a husband. She wrote them in a journal, of course. And what's fun, if you can see on the opposite side, I'll just explain it and then I'll show it. This was July 10th of 1997 that I wrote this in my journal. We actually met in person July 25th. So only 15 days after I wrote this list, we met. And he had 38 of the 40 qualities on my list. So... I'll just show you again if you've watched our story videos. You've seen this journal. There's there's some of them. There's more of them. <laughs> She's really into lists because, you know, I just saw the backside of a completely different list as she was flipping through the book the way that she had it opened up. She likes her lists. Yes, I do. I still do. So I just felt like there was somebody out there for me, but I didn't know who they were, didn't even know what. I just felt this knowing of something deep. And that's very common for a lot of people. So that was the four points that we put in stage one, the yes. before the meeting. Now, stage two, the meeting. This is pretty exciting stuff. Yes, when you finally meet your twin flame and it's magic. Point five is meet in an unusual slash unplanned yet very synchronistic way. Yes, so I get to demonstrate again. Thank you, you read my point because I was too busy being excited about demonstrating. This, I am so grateful to still have. This was how we met. I oddly put a note in the laundry room. Of course, I had just moved to a new city and I was just looking for friends. And I didn't know how else to do that. So I put a note in the laundry room and Rob happened to be one of the people that answered <laughs> Angie isn't the kind of person to put a note in a laundry room. No, I am not. And I'm Still the, not. And I'm the kind of person where I read those and I say, yeah, I don't know what kind of trap is that. I, I, I would never normally pull. Who's the weirdo that would do that? Yeah, I normally wouldn't pull a tab off, a phone number tab off the bottom of one of those lists. Yeah. But all that happened. Yes. Felt drawn to do so. Yes. Do you want to read number six or can I read No, 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 we'll stay in order. We'll stay in order? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Instant connection. Feel like you've known each other forever. <laughs> we were not on the phone very long in that very first phone call conversation before things just fit. Yeah. Her voice sounded right. Her, her, the way she was talking just sounded familiar. It was, it was very uncanny. It was, there's no way that that conversation was only going to last five minutes. Yeah, it was just so comfortable. In fact, again, I have this written in my journal, so I'm going to read it to you. This was July 23rd of 1997. And I said, I called the guy who left a message on my machine last night. Robert, I like him. He sounds like he has a passion for life that I do. He has a cool message and his voice is very upbeat. He sounds like someone I'd like to get to know. So even before we talked, I already felt the connection with him. And then I wrote um, the next day after we had talked, I said, wow, I just got off the phone with Robert. He called at 9 p.m. or so, and we talked until 1045. Fantastic guy. And you still are. Thank you. <laughs> and I said, now there's someone I clicked with. So it was instant connection. We just knew we knew each other without knowing how. So number seven is the universe appears to be working in your favor, supporting your connection. This is another common one for a lot of people. Just as we were getting together, I had two weeks holidays booked and not a whole lot going on in there other than going to the mountains a few times to climb and hike and whatnot. So I just, just as we're getting together, I've got a whack of time that I wouldn't normally have. Yep. And I, of course, had just moved, so I didn't have a job yet and didn't have any friends yet, really. 
So we had two weeks of uninterrupted time to spend with each other, to connect deeply, um, and to just get to know each other. Now, I also want to just clarify, I know we're talking about meeting and meeting in person, and there's some of you that have connected with your twin flame over the internet, and you've never even met them. But these signs can still definitely apply to you, even if you've not met in person, as you're already going to notice as we're going through them. So just keep that in mind, that you don't have to go through the stages and have them all make sense to your own journey, but the signs still fit. Point number eight, you have a lot of common interests and similarities, parallel, similar lives, uh, traits, histories, birthdays, <laughs> astrology, etc. Yes. Yeah, we, after, as soon as we got into really communicating about what we liked and, and various other bits like that, uh, we liked the same foods in many respects, uh, skydiving, white Whitewater rafting. Totally. We're all both adrenaline junkies. Yep, because <laughs> all that was just already in line. Yes. And it's not uncommon for people to have similar birth dates or similar life path numbers, uh, similar astrology, all yeah. sorts of different things. Yeah, we're both fire signs. Yeah. Yep. Both grew up in the same city, yes. Yes, that's another odd thing. We both grew up in a city called Edmonton and then both moved to Calgary and met in Calgary. Yeah. So, yeah, that's another common one. In fact, just to share, we know another twin flame couple in Union. They discovered they lived only three hours from each other, but they literally met halfway around the world. They were both there for different circumstances and met each other and realized they lived three hours apart. So you get these weird, unique things that just make you go, something's different about this. This is too much to be just coincidence. Yeah. All right. Number nine, you feel comfortable and safe with each other and being with the other feels like home. That's another very common one that so many people say, I just, they're like, I feel like home with this person. And I know for me, that's exactly how it felt. Because I had so much trauma around men in my life, I had not dated other than one other person um, before moving to Calgary. So I wasn't very comfortable with men or relationships, yet with Rob, it was instant. When he invited me to come be closer with him, I was in his arms in a second. I didn't even think about it. I didn't have to think about it. It just felt safe. It felt comfortable. And that's exactly what it felt like was home. Sort of like snuggling into a beanbag chair. Totally. To use one of our terms. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, almost the opposite of all the similarities. Uh, the person you meet may not be the normal type that you're attracted to. Yet you still feel attracted and connected. Yeah, for me, I have always been more drawn to suit and tie kind of guys. Um, very business-like men. And Rob's much more of a rugged, outdoor-y kind of guy. And uh, didn't matter to me. He wasn't my type, per se, but the connection was there. Yeah, and I was used to hanging around people who uh, were... Very athletic. They could just go out and hike 15 miles in the mountains, no problem. Pick a day, any day, even that, even though that's not something they normally practice. Angie and I, when we met, and Angie was not really uh, the athletic type. We'll no. put it that way. I was active, but definitely not athletic like Rob was or still is. <laughs> Number 11. Yay for 11. You complement each other and fit well, and one strength is the other weakness. So you're much like puzzle pieces. You just have a natural fit to each other. And in fact, um, we wanted we, to show you something fun from our journey. We like puzzles. Yes, we do. Puzzles have become part of our lives numerous times. see if times. I can do this. So the puzzle on this side, I actually made for Rob a week after we met. And the second puzzle I got made for us for our wedding. But this puzzle just was very significant to us. And I didn't even understand about puzzle pieces or how we fit together as twin flames. I just felt drawn, nudged, channeled, really, to make this puzzle. Yeah, the first puzzle uh, had all of our words that we'd 
developed into our own little language. Uh, for example, beanbag chair. Yes. Yeah. Uh, communication was another one that was big for us. Uh, Mountains and... And uh, tiger ice cream. Yeah. All sorts of crazy things. Yeah, just, just words that were important to us already. Yeah. The second puzzle, on the back of the second puzzle, each one of the pieces has people who were at our wedding. Yeah. They all signed the back of a puzzle piece, and that became our wedding puzzle. Yes, exactly. See, we, we like, like puzzles. We like goofy things like that. <laughs> Something we share in common. <laughs> okay, so that's the meeting, meeting bit. Um, stage three, bubble love. Mm, everybody loves lot. the bubble love phase. Yeah. <laughs> Have otherworldly spiritual magical experiences. Magic is often a common word in the TF world. Yes. Used to describe the connection. Yes. For us, uh, on our first day, there was the reverse sunset. That was that was huge for me. I had never seen anything like that before. And or after. We've yeah. just we've described what that is numerous times before, and I, I don't really want to get a whole lot into it, but. Yeah, when water is reflecting the water, right. When sunlight is reflecting the wrong way on water from the back of a cloud during a sunset, we actually get more sunlight coming to you from the <laughs> east, even though the sun's setting in the west. It's, uh, it was magical. It is magical. Yes. Yes. And then for me, it was seeing angels and auras. Rob's aura was the very first one I saw, and I think we'll talk about that in another point below. But yeah, just very otherworldly experiences. Um, just again, to share somebody else's journey, we know somebody who had, like, they felt like they were floating off the ground after meeting their twin flame. So you have these weird, unique experiences that you just can't even really explain with logic. So number 13 is an instant strong love and amazing chemistry. So again, just that, that instant, I know you. I don't even know how I know you, but I know you. And it's not even just the knowing, it's that deep love. Because what's happening is your soul has recognized itself in another body. And it's like this, this poof and this magic of explosion of love happens. Yeah, I, I felt so much, and I, I called it emotion at the time, but I couldn't even contain it all within me. I didn't know what to do with it all. So I coined the term, my cup runneth over. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with how good I was feeling. Yeah, this was actually just the second day that we met. Rob yeah. was like kissing my face all over, every ounce of my face, my cheeks, my nose, my eyelids. And he just kept saying, my cup runneth over. And he was just literally exploding with love. Number 14, <clears throat> your world is turned upside down. Yet, it's in perfect order at the same time. Yes. Yeah, we spent all of our time together. We did, because, of course, I had a lot of time to spend because I was on time off. And it was very intense. And But yet, it felt so natural to yeah. do so. Totally yeah. wasn't what I was expecting. So my world was all upside down. I wasn't going out and, and doing what's called peak bagging, which is getting to as many mountain peaks as you can in a day or a week. It just wasn't wasn't really my destiny for that week. I didn't understand that, but it felt so right. Yes. And number 15, you can talk about anything and everything. You have endless conversations. And this one is definite for us. Our very first day together was 17 hours in the mountains. And we did talk about everything and anything. And in our first week together, we had a span of 90 hours of talking with only eight hours of sleep. Rob actually stopped and recalculated it all back then to figure out how on earth did we stay awake for so long. We would talk and talk and talk, fall asleep for an hour, and then talk some more. It was crazy. Yeah, I, it, I, I don't know how we did that. I've never been able to do that again, not even close. Yep, that's bubble love. <laughs> then... The, the connection sparks a spiritual or kudalini awakening, activations in one or both of you. Yes. So for me, that was seeing angels and auras. Um, I remember when I saw Rob's aura, I was just like, you have green and yellow color around you. What is that? I didn't even know what an aura was. And he's like, oh, you're seeing my aura. So that was a huge activation for me. And then I started seeing angels and it was just, I was awakening all over the place spiritually. 
Number 17, time distortions in both directions, shortened and lengthened. Yes, a day for us was like um, an hour because time would just go so fast. But yet a week was like a month because so much was happening that, I mean, we were already talking about marriage after a month because we felt so deeply connected with each other. Time was going faster and slower at the same time. Yeah. It, it, learning exponen exponentially fast, but yet... Time was also going so fast. It was really, really hard to get a grip on it. Yeah. Sometimes an hour felt like a whole day, and sometimes a day only felt like an hour. Yes. Yep. It's number 18. Oh, I get to read this one. Uh -huh. Intimacy, sex, <laughs> slash sex, is soulful, sacred, and connective on all levels. Yes. What was our example for that one? We probably have many. Yeah, it was <laughs> unrushed. would start with us finding each other in our sleep. Yeah, so we would find each other. We would just end up physically together in our sleep and then wake up and go, what on earth? What's happening? Mm -hmm. It was just truly like the soul wanting to reconnect with itself physically. And the sacred part of this also can be that Angie also saw her first angel. That during is this when time. I saw my first angel. Yes, we were in the middle of being intimate, and I, I had to stop because I just this seven foot tall angel was sitting in front of us, and I didn't know what to do. It was stunningly beautiful and so full of love. Number nineteen is merging, melting, um, or merging melty magnetic energy together. So you often hear Twin Flames describe the connection as very magnetic because, again, your one soul is desiring to connect back with itself. So you feel that strong magnetic pull to each other. Sometimes when we snuggle, it's... I first coined it as the unzip snuggle because I felt like I'd unzipped like a sleeping bag and wrapped myself around Angie and it's all zipped together. We kind of... we. We call it being melty. We melted together. You, you yeah. lose track of whose legs are whose and <laughs> yes. whose arms are whose. You, you, you move a leg and you go, oh, oh yeah, that, that connection spot. Oh, that's mine. That's my leg. Okay. Yeah. Forget where my arm is. Totally. Oh, yeah, it's way over there. Your, your bodies, physical bodies, start to merge together and you can't tell whose is whose. Yeah. Some people mm -hmm. have even looked in the mirror and noticed they now look like they're twin flame. So there's all sorts of different ways that that can happen. Um, Number 20. A soulful, soulful, intense connection and feeling that you're meant or destined to be together. Yes. It's like being married on a soul level. Yes. Which was why, again, for us, we only had known each other a month uh, in this life, of course. But we were already very seriously talking marriage because we just knew we needed to be together. Yeah, we were calling ourselves husband and wife we after, after after only month. one month. And it, and it felt right. Yeah. It felt very bonded, very connected. Yes. Number 21, you feel like you have a big purpose or mission together. So for me, I was told by my angels, because of course once I started seeing them, I started channeling them. They would write through me. They would speak to me. And they kept telling us that we had a mission together. And that was the exact words that they would use. That is so all throughout my journal um, and all my writings and channelings. And they explained, you know, what we'd be doing together and that we had a purpose here. And other people, even if you've not been told that by, you know, somebody else, a spirit guide, an angel, you just have that deep feeling, that deep knowing that this is more than just a love connection. There's a higher purpose to this. And that was all the points that we put under the bubble love stage. Yeah, now it gets a little rough. Stage four is what we called the overload trouble breakdown stage. Yeah. Number tw the, our point number 22 is the first point here, and it's struggling to maintain intensity of the deep soul connection. Yes. You know, with lack of sleep and talking and connecting became too intense, too deep too intimate it just was it was just too much for the rational side of the brain the logical side the 3d side of the brain to sort and file what was going on yeah started to get a little bit scary sort of wonder where did all this come from again yeah yeah real life if you want to put it that way 
starts to kind of kick in and you're like, what? What's going on? This is all a little too much for me. This bubble love stuff is a little intense. And that's definitely what happened to me. So then in 23, your ego starts to come through in fear, insecurity, doubt of the connection. And that's where often the runner chaser stuff comes in, which we'll talk about in a bit. So that was what definitely happened for me and where the breakdown started to happen for me because I still had so much unhealed trauma from my childhood. This deep, intense love just triggered all of that and it scared me. I thought, I can't let somebody in this close to me. This feels unsafe. Yeah, point number one, way back in before the meeting, this is about where it starts to work its way yep. through with the triggers. <laughs> Intensity and vulnerability. Yep. So yeah, I was starting to feel all the intensity, was feeling very vulnerable. And then Rob was also wanting to just get back to normal life. Yeah, you know, I had mountains to climb and work to go to and lots of things to plan and needed to get back to my regimented life. Yeah, okay, that didn't quite work well with the first two and three weeks that we'd been together. Yeah. It, it, there was very, very little resemblance. <laughs> yep. Holidays were over. That's right, time to get back to work. So point number 24, which is about halfway through the overload, trouble, and breakdown stage, imbalances between each other start to become more evident. Yes, I was going back to my regimented side. I call it the drill sergeant side. And Angie, well, okay, she'd, uh, she'd had enough of all this other stuff too. She wanted to get right back into her spiritual side. She went into 5D. Yeah. So yeah, of course, now that I was experiencing all these angels and seeing Way auras, I was, I was expanding immensely in my 5D abilities. So Rob was wanting to go more one way into, you know, back into work and life and everything. And I was going the opposite way, opposite way, opposite way. Yeah. <laughs> and we were now colliding, going the opposite ways, and it just wasn't flowing anymore. It was getting to be a great distance between us. Yes. So then, number 25, you start to have mirroring of all those imbalances happening. And it creates all the triggers from all your unhealed wounds. So this is where a lot of people are probably in this moment of, you know, trying to heal from all those wounds and the triggers that happen because of the imbalances within yourself, but then also between each person. So for us, uh, one example is what we often share with people is a badminton night. Rob was ready to go charge into, let's go play badminton and be intense and have a serious game. And I was just going for fun. So I wasn't prepared with proper clothing and I wasn't carved up like Rob put it. Yeah, <laughs> she was in blue jeans and wasn't carved up. Like how are you supposed to go to play badminton when you're just not ready to go play badminton? But what was really reflecting on the inside was both of our insecurities. I was very insecure because Rob was super intense and, and very active and I was not. So I was thinking, oh gosh, he's going to judge me for, you know, not being so good at this game. And he was feeling insecure because here he was bringing some girl that wasn't very prepared. And he also felt a need back then from his own unhealed wounds to be like super Rob and be the best at everything he did. So on the outside, things look very different, but on the inside, we were both experiencing insecurities and mirroring them back to each other. Point number 26, <sighs> despite the challenges that exist in this stage, you still feel guided and pulled back together. Angie had wrote in her journal that she didn't think that we were going to make it. Yep. And yet... This was happening one night. Rob had to go back to work on a Sunday. He was so intense in his job. And we had started discussing something and we're getting into an argument. So we just agreed, let's stop talking. You work all right. So I was writing in my journal and I was just literally saying, I don't think we're going to make it. And I was sitting at my desk, just charging away, doing what I needed to do so I could get ready for another work week. And then all of a sudden, there was angels covering the entire office. I, I could see them. them and Rob felt them. And the love was so intense, it was like the whole universe was trying to guide us back together, saying, no, you will make it. Because I had a lot of doubts at that point, and I was ready to start giving up. But the universe was pushing us back together. 
Number 27. Oh, yeah. A lot of you know this one. The runner-chaser dynamic starts to happen. So for me, I started being the runner because I had so much fear, so many insecurities, was feeling way too vulnerable. Now, often in this dynamic, it's usually the masculine that's the runner. And even though I'm more the feminine in our connection, it was the masculine within me that was running. It was the part of me that hadn't healed, that was so afraid of, of um, getting close to somebody. And the masculine side was like, nope, we need to leave because that's the only way I know how to protect you. So I started being really mean to Rob. I would push him away. I would do terrible things just to feel safe. And I started to realize that I had pushed way too far and... I still had all that huge respect of, well, let's just go with the reverse sunset that was still, even to this day, the biggest sign for Aunt, that I have between Angie and I that we're meant to be together. And I started doing my, my bit of being the chaser. I didn't want to let go of the relationship. I wanted to work through whatever was happening to us. So Angie started into a running phase and I started into chasing and away we went. Yeah, playing that cat and mouse game like most of you know. So that was the last point <laughs> under stage four of overload, trouble, and breakdown. <laughs> Next stage, stage five, separation. Yeah, stage I know you guys know well. Point number 28 is the first point under separation. Repelled apart and break up because of the overload and the fear and the triggering and the healing required. And there's just an inability to grow together. Yeah. So with everything that was just stacked against us, uh, I chose to break up with Angie. I did. I fired her ever so gently. And only because I finally pushed him to the point that he accepted, okay, you need to go, I'll let you go. But often what happens, I mean, every twin flame journey is different in the sense of what causes the split, but it's often, there's just so many triggers happening that you can't stay together anymore. There's so much to work through that, yeah. it's, that, it, that everything just becomes a trigger. Yep. All those old wounds are coming up and all you're doing is shoving them back at each other because you each, if you don't want to look at your own. So you're pointing the finger at them, they're pointing the finger at you and it just causes nothing but fights. But yet, in spite of the uh, either need or urge or desire to break up, point number 29. Uh, yes, the push and pull. So you feel that push to be apart because of everything going on, all the dynamics, yet you feel that magnetic pull back to each other. And you like this, this almost like you can't stay apart, but you can't stay together kind of feeling, you know, because your soul wants to be together. But the ego has so much drama still that it's got to heal from. Yeah, there's a song in my past called Can't Hold On, Can't Let Go. Yes. So for us, even though we broke up because we lived in the same apartment building, we'd still end up in each other's apartments. And it was this constant dance of back and forth. We even got to the point where we were writing notes and putting them under each other's doors because we just couldn't stay out of communication or contact with each other. Gave her space, but not all of it. <laughs> Point 30. Unexplained and unimaginable emptiness, yeah. hopelessness, obsession. And, and like it doesn't even feel like a normal breakup. Nope. I felt so empty. Like it, like a couple of days without contact with Angie. I, there was just nothing I could do to fill up that, that feeling. I could occupy my time, but there was just so much missing. And even just to pop a note under her door was was just enough communication to know that at least I'd tried. And then laying awake sometimes at night, hoping to hear a rustling of a note being popped back <laughs> underneath my door. Yeah, okay. The pathetic things we do is it's, to employ the Really? <laughs> you think you're in control and then no, you're not. <laughs> you, you have all this hope buried in amongst the hopelessness. Yeah, and I felt very hopeless. I just cried and cried and cried. I didn't know what to do with myself to console myself. 
0.31. Oh, yeah. Then you have that soul pain, that rip that you feel when you part. So it's like, you know, in the bubble love or even before sometimes the bubble love, you have that soul merge, right? Where your one soul and two bodies recognizes itself and it comes back together. Now, when you have the separation, your soul feels like it's literally being torn apart from itself. And it hurts. It hurts so bad. Not that I need to tell you guys that. You know. I call these Band-Aid oh. moments where you just got to rip off the Band-Aid. Uh, or at least you think you have to rip off the Band-Aid. It just hurts like ripping off a Band-Aid. Yeah. Every time you're out of touch or you're just in touch and you're just like saying bye, it just hurts. Yeah. And you almost feel like a part of your body has been ripped off of you, you know, like an arm or something. It's, it's that painful. And it feels physical. It doesn't just feel like emotional pain. It feels like physical pain. Point 32. <sighs> One or both try to cut the energetic cords to sever the connection. And that's just an attempt to stop feeling the other, the other person, the other half of your soul. Who hasn't done that one, right? We, We've we all haven't. tried the cord cutting. We got it in brackets, <laughs> which doesn't work. Yeah, because it's... like it's been shared many times, not only in our videos and many other ones, you're the same soul. You can't cut the connection to yourself. You can try, but it doesn't work. So all this frustration can lead to point number 33. Yes, and this is where one or both of you experiences the dark night of the soul, that deep pain that causes you to shatter in so many ways. You collapse physically, emotionally. Some people have been hospitalized. I've known people that couldn't eat for weeks. Um, for us, Rob went through a, a serious emotional crash. Yeah, I went through a partial breakdown and I uh, ended up on antidepressants, which was another just terrible moment in my life. <laughs> Yeah, and Angie uh, became very suicidal. Very suicidal. Now, of course, she didn't talk about that to me, but that was her own dark night of the soul for her to deal with. Yes. That's not These dark nights of the soul are not often not communicated between the two twins. Yeah. Yeah. Point 34. Mm. Even though you're not together, you can still feel each other. You still know what the other is thinking. Yeah, that... 5D connection just just gives you those hints and, and you don't want to discredit them but usually when you check notes later you realize you are feeling either the anguish or the emotions of, of all types yep. of your twin even yep. though you're in separation you still feel them. In fact just an example from our own story is when I was very suicidal I had literally planned to go out not to be too graphic but graphic but stand in front of a train and I had my ha my hand on the door handle to leave my apartment um, and the phone rang and I just felt this desire or need to answer it so I answered it and it was Rob and he was at his busiest moment of his work day um, but yet he just knew he had to phone me at that moment right. and without knowing he knew that I was on my way to end my life so you know, you feel the other person, and you know something's not right. Point 35. Yes. So you still have that unconditional love for each other, even when you're no longer together. So a normal breakup, you break up and you move on, and you maybe don't think of that person anymore, or maybe you don't feel love for them anymore. With your twin flame, they can do the most horrendous things to you, which often does not happen in a twin flame journey. This is the side... Note, most twin flame journeys, it is not abuse that happens. And we're not at all saying to tolerate anything like that because it's a twin flame. It can still happen. It yeah. does. But it's not something some people think, oh, because this is my twin flame, I have to stick for it. No. No. That's part of your growth is to stand up for yourself. But, you know, Angie had had a tough time. She ended up being evicted from her apartment. But that didn't matter to me. We met... A while after that had happened and I still loved her just the same yep yeah the, uh, the knowing that she'd had a messy financial time in her life didn't have anything to do with my love for her here I was a registered nurse working at 7-eleven and Rob came to visit me at work one night and I was mopping floors and it didn't make him love me any less because 
you love a person for who their soul is, not what their actions are, not what's happened to them in their human life. That's the deep unconditional love that you experience with each other. Okay, point number 36. You still see continuous signs and synchronicities, <laughs> guidances, support. You feel like you're getting help from spirit. For us, that often came in songs. Just, just when you're thinking about someone, you hear a song like, trust me, this is love. Trust who? Why, like, why, why are you telling, why is this song popping up now? Oh, or why does it show up four times in the same day? Well, of course, back in a day when there wasn't a lot of repetition in no. a lot of radio stations. We didn't have serious satellite radio that played the same song over and over and yeah, stuff like that. Flip, flip uh, radio stations and the song would just show up again a few minutes later. Yes. Different stations. Stuff like that would happen to us. And I know for other people it's you see their name everywhere or you see numbers everywhere. Something, anything that reminds you of them, right? It's the constant, the universe is telling you, yes, this is your person. So you see all sorts of things, all sorts of reminders, signs, synchronicities about them. Now during separation, oftentimes one or both go through times of growth where they where they get back to a bit more core growth, especially in the 5D. And point 37 uh, addresses that head on. Yes. So one or both of you may discover or remember past lives that you've had together that were traumatic or where you weren't able to be together. And uh, this definitely happened for me. This was years later in our journey, but it might not be for you. But what I discovered is we had a life in uh, ancient Egypt and it had split us apart because we had met, but I was from a different um, star system at that point. And I had just come to earth to experiment and learn. And I was told I was not allowed to actually be interactive with any humans in a romantic way. And I was with Rob and we were both punished for that. So we were still carrying all those old memories of being punished for being together. So of course, who wants to be together when you feel that, that old memory, even though you're not conscious of it, it's in your cellular memory and in your soul memory. Yeah, you still get this inkling of past karma that did not work out so well for you and and that your twin might be bringing you closer to that. It, it can be scary. Yes. But you become more aware of those things as you start to start to review what had been happening so far in your relationship. Even if you're looking at it from a 3D point of view and then you feel these other pieces, they start to come together. You start to understand these connections. Yeah. So there might be clearing and healing that needs to happen from previous lives in order for the space to open up for union in this life. Point 38. Quite often you both go through a tremendous amount of growth and healing uh, and clearing of templates. Yes. And that's often done through other relationships while you're in separation. Yeah. I had... I had numerous people in my life, including a 12-year relationship, that, that I went through a tremendous amount of growth with. This other person was into many, many things that when, when I was years into that relationship, I started to understand that some of the things that had torn Angie and I apart, the things I just couldn't accept and understand as Angie was massively growing, they weren't quite so weird to me anymore. <laughs> They made yes. their own sense in their little in their little ways. So yeah, your twin or you can get into another relationship. They can marry somebody else. They can even have a child or children with somebody else. They can move away halfway across the world. And yet that is part of their growth. So I know a lot of twins, you know, feel very upset when any of this happens. Like, oh my God, we're never going to come back together because he or she married somebody else. That doesn't necessarily have to be the case. It's just part of their journey at this point because it's helping them heal and clear all of their wounds, their traumas, all of that stuff so that they can find union within themselves and thus union with you as their twin. Point 39. Yes, so this is where often one, usually the spiritual 5D or awakened uh, twin um, or sorry, one is often the, the spiritual 5D awakened feminine, 
This doesn't have to be the case, but that's usually how it works. And the other is more the matrix twin, so it's more the human twin, more the 3D unawakened or masculine. As twins, you start to understand uh, if, there's, if there's roles that need to happen, which role the one and the other assumes. Usually there is a strong, a, a strong pull towards the 5D with one twin and a strong pull towards the 3D with the other, although there's still the common ground. Yes. But one represents one side, one represents the other. And this is where a lot of twins, again, get fearful that, oh, my twin's not awakened, like he or she, because the, sh the feminine, the female person can be carrying the more dominant masculine energy. But you often can fear that, well, they're not awake. They're never going to, they're never going to get this. They're never going to understand our connection. Or they're not awake, so how are they going to do their healing? So I'm doing all this work, and they're not doing any mm -hmm. healing. Remember that. Yin and yang together still make a circle. Absolutely. So Good. you're each going through your path just in unique ways. So just allow them to be where they're at. Point 40. One or both, often the spiritual 5D one, discovers the twin flame and soul information synchronistically. Yes. Yep, somebody, somebody starts to all of a sudden figure out and they learn about the twin flame connection by definition. Yes. Yeah, you start to ask, what is this? This is not a normal relationship. This is weird. We have weird things going on. And oftentimes, because of our internet, and thank God for it, most of us discover it through that way now. We Google, we Google whatever we Google and we see twin flames and then it touches you on such a deep level and you go, that's it, that's, that's, that's what I am. So again, a lot of you or all of you that are watching this have obviously experienced that in some way or you wouldn't be here. Um, but yes, you often find the meaning of what you are and then you want to share it with your other half and go or other whole because they're not yeah, a half. <laughs> they're, they're their own. That's right. So for me, that was what happened is I experienced discovering it. I was just searching, going, what on earth are we? And Googled soulmates and found the words twin flames, and it just totally hit my soul. And after all those years apart and still understanding and knowing that there was a special connection between us, even though I was never expecting it to lead to anything, I still was always curious why that connection had existed. So I was looking for answers. Yes. Then that was the last point that we had under separation. Yes. And just before we go to the next one, again, I wanted to just remind, clarify that these signs don't all have to be experienced within the stages that we have said. You might have experienced them before certain stages, after certain stages, or you might experience them in multiple stages. It doesn't mean that you're not a twin flame or that you are a twin flame. It's just we're going by our journey. There is so many different ways to walk this path. Oh, we, can only totally. we can only generalize. Yeah. Stage six in our uh, list starts with point number 41, and stage six is reunion. Yes. Point 41. So you get pulled or guided back together after a time apart. And we know some of you have had multiple reunions, and that's okay, right? It doesn't necessarily mean it's the reunion where you stay together. But what happens is you feel drawn back to each other for whatever reason. It's probably because you've done some soul growth, and now it's time to come together to share on a deeper level, a soul level, a cellular level, some of the things that you've learned, some of the things that you've cleared, and then you either continue on the path of reunion, or if there's still more work to do that you need to do separately, then you split again. And that's okay. Just about the time it was time for us to start to get more back into communication, to let each other back into our lives, I was in between jobs. There I was, a bunch of time on my hands again. It was sort of like a deja vu. Yes. Except I didn't think of it that way back then. But it... Uh, it was another time where the door opened for us to start to drift back together. Yep. And number 42. One or both are reactivated to the connection. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you might have a long 
period apart, which is what our journey was. And you kind of forget about this person, even though they're always in the back of your mind somewhere. You just but you, turn off the switch. Yep. Yeah, and you move on with your life because you think, okay, well, clearly this is never going to happen. So you finally surrender to the journey and just go, whatever, I'm moving on. And then all of a sudden something turns that switch back on. And that's exactly what happened for me. We went out for a uh, lunch. Rob, because he had time off, he was between jobs. He took me out for a birthday lunch and it just changed. We had met other times in between our separation, but there was no reactivation. And no. all of a sudden this one, that's when all of a sudden I'm like, what is different? Flip the switch again. Here yep. we go. My soul was reawakened to our connection. Point 40, well... Hmm, I read 42. You can have 43. Oh, okay. This is where you have the telepathic communication. And again, you might have this during separation. We did not, but it is very common to have this during separation. So you can easily put this in that uh, stage. So for us, it was unique that I just wasn't even trying. I didn't even know about telepathy. All of a sudden, Rob starts talking to me in my head, and I'm just thinking I'm kind of a nutcase. But he's saying all these things that are making sense that are things I wouldn't make up. My, my mind wouldn't even think to think those things. So I started to discover that we can actually have that ability to talk in a 5D realm. And you can have so many powerful healing communications with your twin in uh, 5D. Point number 44. The one who knows of the connection, the twin flame connection, <laughs> wants to or is guided to tell the other. Yes. How many of us that were the ones that knew first are like, oh, I got this burning desire. I want to tell him or her. And what I've always recommended to people is do it for the reasons of your highest self rather than your ego self. Because if it's your ego that just wants to tell them to go, guess what? And now we should be together. That's probably going to push them further away. But for me, I was very strongly guided. I was the one fighting it. I kept telling the universe, I'm not telling him nothing. We were both in other relationships, even though mine was already breaking down and his was too, which I didn't know about. I just was like, I'm not telling him. I'm, we're just developing a friendship. I'm not going to ruin that. And the universe screamed so loud that I finally could not resist. And so with all the awakening of the person who's in the 5D, point 45. Yes, so the matrix 3D or unawakened twin begins to awaken to the connection. So something starts to shift in them naturally. It may be because you've shared the information with them, or it just may be their own stuff that starts happening because it's divine time for them to start knowing. This actually links back to three or four of the other points where even without knowing about Twin Flames, I was letting Angie back into my life. And with all the growth that I experienced, she was even fitting better. So better. So the, the Twin Flame knowledge really helped accelerate a awakening that I was going through. Yes. But it was very much an accenting of what was already happening inside of me. Really needed it, though. It was really quite the kickstart. Yeah. Point 46. Ah, you start to realign realign on all levels. You start to text and speak at the same time, uh, doing the same things. Yeah. You know, you'd not send a text for hours and hours, and I'd grab my phone and go to send a text, and ping, and you would be texting me. And again, this is also common in other stages, too. Again, for us, this is when it happened was in this stage. But yeah, we would, it would just be the weirdest thing. We would text at this, not only text at the same time, but we would say the same thing. We'd have the same emojis even. It was just funny. So we started calling it TF moments or twin flame twin moments. Twin flame moments. <laughs> yep, just had a twin flame moment. You can't make this stuff up. Yeah. Yeah. Point number 47. Yes, so your one soul energy starts to merge together. So much like you may have experienced in the bubble love where, you know, if you looked in the mirror, you saw their face or your bodies would merge when you would be together physically, you can start having more of that happen. So for us, it happened in a couple different ways. Um, there was one time where 
I had this beautiful experience. I was meditating and all of a sudden I just saw our one soul and it was just floating above me and it was very much like northern lights if you've ever seen those or know what northern lights are. It just danced and flowed and it just had this beautiful energy to it and it was all the colors of the rainbow that just shifted, flowed. It was so elegant and we, because it was our one soul back together, just radiated and emanated pure love and it was the most beautiful thing I've ever experienced. Other people have had it and I've also had it where I could feel him inside my body. It was my hands but it was him moving my hands and it was so weird. <laughs> so different people experience it different ways but those are some some of the ways. So as point 48 under reunion you start to realize how all, how all these life experiences that you've had were like puzzle pieces helping each other come into union at the perfect and divine time. Yes. You start to look back over how you first met and what caused your separation and what's starting to bring you back together and why things work now when they didn't work before and who was influence, influencing and teaching you. Uh, you start to realize that this is almost like a part of a plan and just like when you have that that first time where something magical happens that causes you to believe in your in your uh, journey the first time around you have a second time around yeah. aha moment you start to realize that the first thing for example us or the reverse sunset it wasn't just a one-off it was just a sign yeah and you start to feel more start to see more signs again and you start to see the divinity in the entire path. You know, I can remember my whole life feeling so bitter. Like, why was I dealt such a hard life this time? And then over the years, we were in separation, and I was studying books and learning more about soul growth. One of the most common books for me was Conversations with God, where I started learning that my soul chose it all. And one of my favorite quotes from that book is, we are victims to nothing, and um, we've chosen all of it, right? So I started then still feeling angry at my soul, thinking, what were you thinking? Why did you have to choose the hardest path? Like, did you really think you needed to take on the world in one life? And then when I discovered Twin Flames and we were starting to come back together, it was like, oh, now I get it. This all had purpose. This all had reason. And even every connection I had, every relationship I had, they were all giving me another piece of myself back, another puzzle piece, so that I could find that wholeness, so that we could find wholeness. So yeah, you start to see that everything you've been through, every challenge, every hurt, every pain, every experience, all had reason. Point 49, we're almost to the yes, end. Yes, we are! The last point of reunion is still a reminder that not everything just goes perfect because you're now coming back together. That's right. Point 49. So you may still experience a lot of challenges, challenges and obstacles during or even after union. We still had lots of problems with our previous relationship people. And both of my parents were sick and dying at the time. So there was just lots going on in my plate. And then my karmic partner was uh, putting lawsuits on me. Just I didn't know at the time he was a true narcissist, but I learned later that he was. So just a whole lot of drama there. So we had an enormous amount of challenges. And we're not sharing this to scare people, but it is kind of common. We've heard from many other Twin Flames who are now in union that have also had their own challenges. I've heard from some that actually went homeless after getting into union. Um, I've heard from some that have had enormous family challenges because one family member doesn't like one twin flame or vice versa. There's just a lot of obstacles still to overcome because what's happening is your soul as it's coming back together. There's a couple things happening. It's saying to itself, first of all, are you sure? Are you ready? And you're going to be handed some challenges to decide if you're really up to the challenge of facing them together and working through them as a union and if you're not that's okay then you do another separation and then come back together you'll probably find that the majority of the challenges though 
as much as you, you still could have challenges between the two of you, a lot of these challenges are from the outside. Yes. And don't take these challenges as just being wedges between the two of you. A lot of times, these challenges, as much as they're struggles, are actually more to, to bring you back to closer together, give you that extra nudge to know that you can trust your relationship. Yes. And that the challenges from the outside are meant to bring you together, not push you back apart. And a perfect example of that is when my karmic partner, even though we had already split up, Rob and I were now together, living together, um, I kind of felt like the, the court cases he had with me was going to take years. And I begged Rob, I sobbed, saying, please leave my life because I don't want you to be a part of this drama. And he said, absolutely not. And you put it so beautifully. He said, I left you once, way back in 1998, and he said, I'm never doing it again. So those are the things that solidify you. That's when you go through those hard times, but you realize you are committed deeply to not only yourself, but each other. And once that commitment to stay together has solidified, once you know that you're making a good long-term run, you're happy with this, this has finally turned out to be not, not even, you can't even call it a dream come true because for many people, the dream completely dies and just starts again out of left field. Mm. But stage seven has only one point on it and it's the last point. We could put more, but we thought we'd just leave it at 50. We call it, <laughs> we call it mission. And I'm not even going to read what's there. Mission to me is having gone through all of this the realization of twin flames, uh, the coming back together, the, the splitting up that happened before, you realize that there's many people out there who are at various stages along this path. And mission brings us to what we're doing right now, is talking about this, trying to see if there's anything we can do to help others yeah. who are at whatever stage along the way of what we've just talked about. Yeah, and so that's the thing when you come back to Union, and actually, again, to clarify, some people are already on mission even before Union. But once you come into Union, you start to discover your mission together with each other. And then you realize this isn't just about having a fairy tale relationship and a nice romance. You understand the bigger purpose of what you are as a twin flame, why you're here, why you've chosen to come as one soul and two bodies. <laughs> you start to realize that the energy between you two is is very much a stronger, more divine energy than, than just being together and being in love and existing on the planet. There's so much more that can be done with it. Yeah. And whether it be helping the earth or understanding, learning things that can help others or just, hey, don't forget about your own personal growth. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so there's just so much that can fall into being part of mission. It's not about making uh, days or hours or weeks of dedicated differentness in your life. It doesn't have to be a gigantic mission. No. But nonetheless, this whole journey does, it does come across as being very, very special. And it does apply to other people. You will meet, you'll be drawn to or other people who need it will be drawn to you. So you will find that your story becomes relevant to others. Yeah, and on that note, that's what I was going to share is how our mission started coming about is we were in the process of getting married. We were already planning our wedding and stuff and we already felt this soul call that you need to start sharing your story. And I remember saying to Spirit, I will gladly serve. I am here to serve, but can I get married first? Like, can can we just take a backseat to mission until we're married? So yeah. spirit kind of backed off a bit because I we were feeling such strong nudges to get out there and start doing videos and start sharing. And I was like, definitely, I'm happy to do it. But can I like slow down and just plan my wedding? <laughs> Focus on that. And um, pretty much af right after we got married was just, that was it. Spirit was calling us. And I remember fighting it at first because I... I'm a private person. Not that you would know that now. I've read my whole journals in our stories. <laughs> but um, 
spirit was like, nope, this is what you agreed to do and this is what you're doing. And I'm like, okay, I'll do it. Just be gentle. And I remember spirit, it felt like this push, literal push on my back going, do it. And I'm like, I'll do it. Just, just let me do it on my own time. I was terrified. Yeah. But that's the thing. When you know it's your calling, even if you're fearful, if you're scared, if you're terrified, you face those fears and you do whatever your mission is. And just also to clarify, mission doesn't have to be being on the internet, doing videos, writing posts. Everybody's mission's different. We know lots of twin flames that are in union that aren't out there in the internet or anything like that. There's lots of people helping just day to day other people and their mission is just as important as anybody else's. Yeah, just sharing love or being role Absolutely. models within just your own social circles. It, yes. it, it, it can work that way just very easily. Yeah. You don't have to be way out there. You just, just, just do what you can or just do what you're doing. And you oftentimes won't even realize yes. how much you're helping others. Your fairy tale story that you have as an example can just be so inspirational to others. It really can. Yeah. So honor your own nudges and, and allow yourself to follow your call and do whatever you feel guided to do. And, and don't compare yourself with others thinking, well, their mission's more special or they're touching more people. We are all yeah. touching people. And with that ripple effect, we are all helping in the ways we agreed to. So that was our 50 points. Yes. So hopefully you got through them all. And if you have other ones that we didn't cover that you want to share, feel free to comment. We'd love to hear your uh, your own experiences. There'll be soon a list of 100. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. With so that, with that, we will say goodbye. Bye. Bye. We love you guys.